Good morning, and welcome to Grace Lutheran Church. As we join together for worship this morning, you're invited to follow along with what is printed on your screen, or if you have a worship folder that you have found on our website, you can use that as well. For updates, uh, for Bible study, all the resources of what's going on at Grace Lutheran Church, you can find them at gracelutheransaz.org. This morning, we join together for worship in celebrating Christ's victory, his victory specifically over despair. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin. For faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do, you should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy for the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you. Hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy for the patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, Live in us, that we may live for you. Amen. God, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world from the despair of death. 
by his resurrection to life, grant your faithful people gladness of heart and the hope of eternal joys. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. comes from Acts chapter 24, beginning with verse 10. As the Apostle Paul is on trial, he relies on Jesus' resurrection as his hope and his comfort. So we read, When the governor motioned to him to speak, Paul replied, Because I know that you have been a judge over this nation for many years, I gladly make my defense. You can verify for yourself that it was no more than 12 days ago when I went up to worship at Jerusalem. They did not find me arguing with anyone in the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they, they cannot prove to you the accusations they are now making against me. But I do confess to you that I worship the God of our fathers according to the way which they call a sect. I believe everything written throughout the law and in the prophets and I have the same hope in God that these men have, that there is going to be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. This is the reason I continue to do my best to have a clear conscience toward both God and people. After several years, I came to bring my people's gift for the poor and to present offerings. While I was doing these things, they found me ceremonially purified in the temple without a crowd or disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who want to be here before you and bring charges, if they have anything against me. Or at least these men here state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin 
unless this is about the one thing I shouted while standing in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. This is the word of our Lord. A reading from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face shine upon us. May your ways be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. This is the word of our Lord. Our second lesson comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning with verse 17. Our comfort in difficult days is in Christ and in his victory and the resurrection he offers to us. If you call on the Father who judges impartially according to the work of each person, conduct yourselves during the time of your pilgrimage in reverence, because you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, not with things that pass away, such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like a lamb without blemish or spot. He was chosen before the foundation of the world, but revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. This is the word of our Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What does despair look like? Alice had run the family business and was going into work for her last day. It had been in the family for four generations. But today she had to go and close the doors for the last time. This small neighborhood bakery was never going to make baked goods again for the community. On top of that, she had used up all of her savings and her entire credit line just trying to keep it open. Gordon was 40 years old, had three wonderful children and a loving wife. He was diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer just four months ago. After intense chemo treatments, he lost the battle battle to cancer, leaving behind a grieving family and many beloved community members. Jared and Betty had been married for two years and were expecting their first child. There was great excitement for this blessing. It was going to be the first grandchild on both sides of the family. When they went in for the 20-week ultrasound, the doctor couldn't find a heartbeat. After further examination, it was determined that she had suffered a miscarriage. Bill was an ICU doctor. He had been averaging 14 hours, six days a week when he worked. And there he watched helplessly and hopelessly As patients passed away all alone with nothing he could do, the guilt was overwhelming. Feelings of despair seem to be pretty commonplace right now. It might even be one of the most common emotions that people are struggling with. Helpless and hopeless. Life is so out of our control There's nothing we can do. These feelings of despair are very real. Something that we struggle with, and not only us, it's again a a common feeling that people are going through. As we dig into our text this morning, we encounter two disciples that were struggling with despair. They didn't know where to turn, all hope was lost. But Jesus comes and meets them, comforts them, and shares with them his victory, his victory over despair. So hear now the words from Luke chapter 24. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about all of these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing this, Jesus himself approached and began to walk along with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. He said to them, What are you talking about as you walk along? Saddened, they stopped. One of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? What things? He asked them. They replied, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. But we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. Not only that, but besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Also, some women of our group amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. When they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb. They found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. 
He said to them, How foolish you are, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and to enter his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all of the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village where they were going, he acted as if he were going to travel farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, since it is almost evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he reclined at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and began giving it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Then he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us along the road, and while he was explaining the scriptures to us? They got up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven, and those who were with them assembled together. They were saying, The Lord really has been raised. He has appeared to Simon. They themselves described what had happened along the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread. This is the word of our Lord. This morning we encounter two disciples traveling back to their home. Now we understand that these two were were not part of the, the twelve but they were clearly part of some inner circle. The, the, the gathering, the group, was often bigger than just 12. We often hear of the, the many women and, and the others that were in this close group of disciples. And these two were, were on their way home. It had been the Passover weekend, which should have been the, the highlight of their year. The, the greatest weekend every year was Passover weekend. Time to celebrate with family and friends, to to gather together to remember what God had done for his people and also to look forward to what God was going to do for his people to save them. But this weekend wasn't so happy, wasn't so joyous. They left saddened. This weekend didn't turn out as they had hoped, they were discouraged. They were actually in a state of despair. These two disciples had just simply said, enough is enough on this weekend and we're going home. Now maybe you have seen depictions of these two disciples walking along the road. Sometimes you you see them as two men walking there. But it seems highly likely that it was probably a a couple, a, a man and his wife, Cleopas and his wife, maybe even possibly his wife Mary as they were traveling there back to their home. And on this route, as they're they're traveling along, they're they're talking about all the things that had happened, having a, a normal conversation about how their weekend went and they were headed back home. On their travels, they encounter this this man. We we know it's Jesus. But they're kept from recognizing him, and he, he kind of just jumps into their conversation and says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they, they say, well, how do, you, how do you not know what we're talking about? There's, there's only one topic right now of discussion. It's the only topic that's going through Jerusalem. That Jesus was crucified. And they describe their emotions, their, their feelings about, about what had happened that weekend. We had such high hopes for Jesus. Maybe they were even there for, for Palm Sunday and saw him riding in and were part of the procession, proclaiming him the son of David, praising him, singing their, their hallelujahs. But as the week went on, as this week ended on, on Friday for them, when, when Jesus died, all hope was lost. They had looked for more. They thought that he was more than just a teacher. He was going to be the redeemer of Israel. But now he was dead. The chief priests crucified him. The, the Romans, Pontius Pilate there, put him on a cross. 
And if that wasn't enough, it's been three days since then, and they said, yeah, and some women went to the tomb, disciples went to the tomb, and it was empty. He wasn't there. It was like insult on top of injury. They just felt so discouraged and and so without hope. Everything that had happened went against what they were hoping for. Went against what they were dreaming of. Went against even what they had seen. They saw Jesus die. They saw him put in the tomb. And these women are making up stories. Doesn't make us feel any better that he's not in the tomb. We just need to go home. Jesus speaks to them and says, how foolish you are. How slow to believe. Now it doesn't matter how nicely Jesus said those words. That's a strong rebuke. It doesn't matter what time and and what point in history you're called a fool or you're called slow. That's not complimentary. Jesus called them out for their despair. For really for their unbelief in his words, in the word of God. And that's why he goes on then he says, well, let me explain to you. And he goes back to the prophets and he works through the Old Testament of all those prophecies concerning the Christ. He references his, his own words, what Christ had said. I mean, Jesus had made it clear throughout his ministry exactly what was going to happen. How he was going to go into Jerusalem how he would be betrayed, how the the chief priests and the elders would, would crucify him. But three days later, he would be raised to life. He spoke to them in plain words and explained exactly what was going to happen. These disciples were struggling with this. They were going through this despair. It's also the same emotion that that we are struggling with today as well. Things aren't going as planned. Life doesn't look the way we we thought it would. There were so many things on kind of an, an upward trajectory. Things were going well. Life looked good. We gathered together as a community, family and friends as a as a church. But now we're restricted. Now we're we're isolated. Our hopes and dreams are are dashed. We're alone. We feel hopeless. We feel helpless. Sin has a tendency to do that. Sin clouds our mind, clouds our thoughts. Sin is what causes this, this great despair. Sin has a way of getting us to focus on the, the temporary things, on the, the here and now, on the physical, on the, on the stuff of this world, rather than on the spiritual, rather than on what Jesus truly came to do. Redemption doesn't come in the form of a vaccine or a medicine. Salvation doesn't get direct deposited in your bank account. Forgiveness of sins doesn't come when restrictions are lifted. Those things are only found in Christ. That only comes through his victory over sin, death, and hell on the cross. That stamp of approval when Jesus rises from the dead assures us that the most important things, the eternal things, are taken care of by Christ. That he is victorious. That he is victorious over our despair. Now, we see Jesus through the the eyes of Scripture. These disciples were still waiting. Jesus acted like he was going to continue on and, and keep on walking, and they invite him into their home. We hear that they sit down, they they break bread, and then, like a light switch. Their eyes are open. Their hearts believe they see Jesus for who he is, the resurrected and risen Lord in their dining room. And then he disappears. This sudden change creates excitement, creates joy, creates urgency. 
they get up from the meal and they rush back to Jerusalem. It changed everything. Jesus was alive. Despair has turned to hope, joy, and comfort. He is alive and they must tell. They have to go and tell these disciples, the, the others. So they rush back and they get there and they hear the disciples proclaiming the same thing. He is alive. He's risen. Such a change. Such urgency. Does the message of Christ's resurrection have that same urgency in our lives? Do we suddenly change our plans? Alter what we're going to do so that we can tell someone about Christ, our risen and resurrected Lord. The victory that he's won. Just think for a moment. There are 7 billion people in the world that don't know Christ. That's a lot of people that you have the opportunity to tell. Now I understand our, our maybe our normal method of, of sitting down with someone, having a, a face-to-face conversation with them. That's not reality right now. But probably a lot of us have got used to video chatting, finding some ways to communicate through technology. Communicate Christ. The urgency to tell people about Jesus because they're in despair. And Jesus is victorious. Jesus offers hope. And it's not so, so much hope about the, the, the virus or, or about their, their daily lives, but their hope for eternity. The problem they can never solve on their own. The thing that they truly need is hope forever. Comfort of everlasting life. And of those 7 billion people that don't know Jesus, you probably don't have to go far. Mission work doesn't have to go to the other side of the world. It probably can even start in your own home, within your own family, one of, one of your neighbors that is close to you or a coworker. Those opportunities are near and they are urgent. Christ is victorious. And Christ's victory is our victory. Because he rose from the grave, it means we too will rise out of our graves, that we will be resurrected with him for eternity. Jesus is victorious over despair. The sin and suffering that causes this despair in this world was taken care of by Christ. He wins. And because he wins, we win. He tells us, don't be a fool. Don't be slow to believe the words. But hear what Jesus says. Believe what Jesus says. Trust in his words. That Jesus is the victor over despair. That Jesus is your victor. And that victory is yours forever. Amen. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, May it guard your hearts and your minds to life everlasting. Amen. We join together in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
we pray. God of all grace, we thank you for the gift of eternal life in your Son, by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and by the faithful testimony of the apostles. You have assured us that our faith stands on a sure and solid foundation. Though we do not see Jesus with our physical eyes, help us to see him with the eyes of faith. Through your Holy Spirit, breathe on your church that it may faithfully proclaim the gospel of our risen Savior with courage and diligence in all lands and to all people. Grant that we also may be illumined by the heavenly light of your word, And so keep us in the one and only true faith. Preserve us from all assaults on our souls. Deliver us from doubt and despair. And preserve us from worldly wisdom and false teaching. Forgive the sins of your people. Strengthen the doubting and the faithless. Bring back the forgetful and wayward. And comfort the anxious and distressed. This morning we offer a special prayer on behalf of Joel Bennett, he is the cousin of our teacher, Vicki and Jeff Smith. He was diagnosed with leukemia this week and will begin treatment. Dearest Lord, be with him during these difficult days. Grant the treatment success as if it is your will. Be with him during these trying times that his faith may grow, that he may grow closer to you, that his family would understand your will. And may all of this, Lord, give you glory and be for the benefit of your kingdom. Grant peace and rest to us all. We pray this in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. We also join to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 